Our second scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 5. Um, we've been recently in the later chapters of Matthew, and now we're heading back um, because who cares? Chronology doesn't matter. Um, but we're going to go to uh, some well-known, familiar verses, the Beatitudes, that begin Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And I invite you now to listen for God's word. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So these verses from Matthew, as I said, are uh, the beginning of what's commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' major teaching moment in that gospel that continues through the next three chapters. And in the full sermon, he's going to cover a broad range of topics, everything from marriage to government to prayer to money to God's kingdom and a whole slew of other things besides. And as we hear more on those topics, Jesus will expand his hearer's understanding of what it means to live a godly life. But this is where he starts with these nine sayings that we call the Beatitudes. Chances are these struck you as a, at least a little bit familiar. You might have seen some of these sayings on refrigerator magnets or embroidered on pillows or in frames hanging over fireplaces because we like these sayings. We remember these sayings. These blessing verses are obviously compelling to us. Everybody wants to be blessed. But there is a problem with the Beatitudes. I think most of us live in a totally different world than the one Jesus' first hearers did. And as a result, when we hear Jesus preaching, we hear something that he's not actually saying. What we hear is somewhat different from what he really meant. So let me take you back to the 80s to show you what I mean. When I was a young lad, my parents came up with an absolutely fantastically effective behavior modification system called the nickel jar. And the way it worked was this. The mom and dad every week would put $20 worth of nickels in a jar that sat on the kitchen counter. And every time Mark and I would get in trouble, every time we would talk back, every time we would fail to do our chores, every time we would, we would argue or whine or do anything we weren't supposed to do, a nickel came out of the jar. And whatever was left in the jar on Saturday was what we got to take to Toys R Us and spend on whatever we wanted. So as you can imagine, some weeks were good. Some weeks we walked out with Lego sets and Nerf toys held proudly in our arms. Some weeks we walked out with nothing. Make no mistake, this system motivated us because even at a very young age, we got the basic concept of a meritocracy. If you perform well, you get a reward. If you don't, you miss out or you even get punished. This lesson is implicit throughout our culture. You get what you deserve. Hard work equals rewards. Laziness equals failure. And these all sound really quite obvious to us. This is the American dream, right? But now, because these assumptions are so deeply ingrained in us, when Jesus talks about blessing, we are preconditioned to hear him in a certain way. And, and like I said, to hear something that I don't think he's actually saying. 
we think of blessing as something that we can earn from God for good behavior. We hear the Beatitudes as if-then statements. If you do this, then God will bless you. Here is your checklist of A, B, C. You tick all the boxes, God will repay you with blessing. I mean, who, who has ever heard the Beatitudes described as just that, Beatitudes? As if this is, this is the list, the attitudes that you should try to cultivate in your heart in order to make God happy. Anybody ever heard it explained that way? I would not be surprised. I heard it explained that way. But there's something suspicious about that to me. For starters, let's consider what most people mean when they talk about being blessed. I mean, how do we usually use that word? People say, I'm blessed because I have good health because I have economic prosperity, because I have particular talents, or even because I had a, a stroke of good luck. People are blessed when things have gone their way and they're in a position of ease and comfort. If we made a list of the most blessed Americans, according to the standards of Hollywood, Washington, and Wall Street, who would it include? I mean, it would be actors and actri actresses, people who live in ridiculous luxury. It would be pop, stores, <laughs> pop stars, people with millions of adoring fans. It would be world-class athletes who can make more in a year than some countries do. It would be media moguls and CEOs and investors and tycoons and politicians who wield power and influence. It would be attractive and charismatic types who seem born to succeed. That's who we think of as blessed. And that's, I think, secretly what we hope God means when he says he will bless us. I think that's what we all want for ourselves. We want to be like these people who have worked hard or at least worked smart and gotten somewhere good in life. They represent the ideal. They, they are the people who we want to emulate. They are the, the status symbols that we want to reach. And the American dream or the prosperity gospel or the Protestant work ethic all tell us that if we just buckle down and trust in God, we'll get there. If we just do what we're supposed to do, one day God will reward us and we'll have it made. But now let's read Jesus' list of blessings again. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who are worn down, those who are demoralized, those who are lacking in means to improve their own lot. Blessed are those who mourn, people who either feel loss themselves or sympathize with others who do. Blessed are the meek, people who fear standing up for themselves. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, people who need justice so badly they can taste it. Blessed are the merciful, people who practice forgiveness. Blessed are the pure in heart, people whose devotion to the Lord is clear and unclouded. Blessed are the peacemakers, people who refuse to empower violence or to worship those who do. And blessed are those who are misunderstood, persecuted, and hated because they follow Jesus Christ. These lists don't sound very much alike, do they? Why are they so different? It's like Jesus is purposefully taking everything we expect and just flipping it upside down. It's the haves versus the have-nots, the winners versus the losers, and Jesus is saying the losers are blessed. Derek Webb, one of my favorite Christian songwriters, says that the, the Christian life is a process of learning to see the world the way Jesus does to recognize that everything that you've valued and everything that you've feared might look different if you looked at it through Jesus' eyes. Maybe we should wonder a little bit more why we look up to, why we want to be like, why we idolize the people on the first list when Jesus says it's the people on the second list who are blessed. It's clear that Jesus and the world don't mean the same thing by blessing. Maybe we'd do better if we paid closer attention to Jesus' target audience. You know, sitting on that hillside as he is teaching, he is surrounded by crowds and disciples who could only be called poor in spirit. 
Life has chewed these people up and spit them back out. They've known nothing but abuse from the rich and powerful. And when Jesus starts talking about the meek and the mourners and the merciful, he's looking at them. These are the people who are gathered right there. He can see the tired wrinkles in their faces and the sagging shoulders, and he can hear the growling stomachs, and he can smell the sickness of untreated disease on these people. He is not talking to those who need to change their attitudes so they can fit onto that list. He's talking to the people who are already there. And he's saying, you are blessed. You are blessed right here, right now, in the present, because you are suffering, and because God has noticed. Because God has seen you, and God is doing something about it. Here's what being blessed really means to Jesus. You are known and loved by God. You are not alone. Let's take note that when Jesus talks about the blessed, Many are victims of circumstances that we would actively avoid. You know, they aren't choosing to endure difficult times in order to reach some promised prize. In most cases, their lives are being defined by the choices that they can't make, the choices that they are not given to make. Nobody chooses to be poor in spirit. Nobody chooses to endure poverty. Nobody chooses to be heartbroken by pain or loss. Nobody chooses to be dragged out of their home and handed a weapon to point at other people. No wife chooses to be abused by her husband. Jesus is not telling anyone, endure this for now in the present and you will be blessed in the future. He's telling them, I see you. I see you. I get it. I know what you're going through. I know it isn't easy, but I'm with you. I am with you. I'm on your side and it is going to get better. This is a crucial difference, even if it seems subtle. The fact that these sayings begin the Sermon on the Mount should underscore the importance of this point. We don't earn God's blessing by doing what God wants us to do, by enduring what's difficult, or by obeying God's commands. Blessing does not come as a repayment for our commitment. In Jesus' teaching, blessing is the first thing. It comes first. It comes before anything that human beings do. You know, the Beatitudes could have been the conclusion of this sermon. They could have followed after three chapters of ethical instruction. They could have been phrased in conditional terms, but they very deliberately were not. Jesus' gospel message is that God offers the downtrodden a gift and not a contract. So in the end, these Beatitudes say much more about God's character than about ours. This is a message of hope, of encouragement, of unconditional love. Hey, are you worn down? Are you overworked? Are you mistreated? Are you forgotten? Are you unappreciated? Did you know that you mean the world to God? It's not about who we're supposed to be. It's about who God is and who we are, therefore, in his sight. We are, again, so used to working for everything that this comes across as almost absurd to believe that God operates differently, that God pours out love upon people entirely apart from what they've done or earned or deserved. But there it is. This is the reality. At the first possible opportunity, God blesses. Jesus isn't explaining the terms or preparing paperwork to sign. He's just plain blessing people. He sees they are in need, and he calls them blessed. And he's not blessing Hollywood or Wall Street people. He's blessing the people that you would never have believed, you would not have imagined, people just like you and me, and people who have it much, much worse. Why? As David Lowe's put it, in order to demonstrate that God regularly shows up in mercy and blessing just where you least expect God to be, with the poor rather than the rich, with those who are mourning rather than celebrating, the meek and the peacemakers rather than the strong and the victorious. This is not where citizens of the ancient world look for God. And quite frankly, it's not where most of us usually look either. 
So look around. Take note. Blessed are the losers and the dropouts and the failures and the ones who didn't make the cut because God doesn't care in the slightest what we think of them. Blessed are the homeless, the imprisoned, the cheaters, the brain dead. God's love for them is not limited by our expectations or hard-heartedness. Blessed are the obsessive, the depressed, the hopelessly naive. Are you surprised by who God has included? Don't be. Just be thankful that you too are blessed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.